Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Uh, unfortunately, Ben won't be able to join us tonight, but I figured I'd do a little episode on Primitive Fire. I'm going to do this as a segue into a video series that I've been working on, which is going to basically cover everything we talk about here tonight in more detail uh, in their own specific videos. So some of the things I wanted to talk about is we're going to basically talk about where we start, where do we go, some tips, some tricks, and things like that. So... Primitive fire can be a little bit intimidating for people coming in if they've never done any kind of primitive fire making. And everybody always thinks primitive fire is going to be, oh, rub two sticks together, get your fire. Well, ideal, yes, that's what we're going for. But we can kind of start way back and build on those skills later. It's almost like a building block kind of uh, kind of system that, that you'd be looking at here. And, and you kind of start from the ground up. So where I'd like to start is basically with tinder bundles or bird's nests or whatever you want to call them. You got to get a good tinder bundle or a good bird's nest to start on because then if it's not great, doesn't matter if your fire making method is correct, it's not going to ignite for you. So what I mean, start with your tinder bundle, start looking around your local area, see the kind of stuff that's going to work for you. Um, so here in Nova Scotia, the things I look for and the most common one that a lot of people look for is going to be birch bark. Uh, yellow is a little bit more than white birch for the fibrous material, but I believe white birch, if you scrape it, is going to give you uh, a better powder that's going to ignite. And once again, you can play around with that uh, and see what you like there. Things like uh, cattail fluff, dry grasses, dry pine needles, pretty much any fibrous plant that's dry is going to work pretty good for you. Um, now, once you start making your tinder bundle, you got to realize you need a lot more than you think you do. The most common issue that I see with people when they start making their tinder bundles and start making um, primitive fire is they just start way too small. And it's not saying you can't do it, but you kind of got to learn to walk before you run. So give yourself a nice big tinder bundle. Uh, I almost say football size starting off. And I mean, that sounds massive. Don't get me wrong. But it's better to have too much than not enough. Um, worst part, it's a little harder to get the materials together and stuff like that. So maybe football is a little big, but I mean, you know, you want a good handful of, uh, materials and honestly, I layer it. That's what I like to do. So starting on the outside, I may take a piece of birch bark, just uh, kind of a strip of it on its own and build everything in that. So I might take my birch bark and then I'll put in some pine needles. Then I'll go with my dry grasses or something like that. Usnia, if it's nice and dry, will work good. Then I'd put what I call flash tinders. Uh, somebody gave me that term before. It's not mine, but it's always stuck in my head. And that's like your really fine fuels that are going to burn really vicious, really fast. That's your cattail fluff or the powder out of birch bark, uh, you know, those really ignitable materials. And once again, I, I encourage you to check your local areas and see what works good for you. Uh, anyway, once you get your flash materials and stuff, then you'll get your ember. Uh, any way you're going to do it, you put it on top of your flash uh, tinders, you fold the whole thing up kind of like a tinder taco, and then you'd start your blowing process into that. But that comes later. So get your tinder bundles figured out, see what materials work for you, see what's going to work in your area, I should say, what you have in your area to work with. And then once you get a kind of a grasp on how you want to layer your tinder bundle together, then I suggest you just try lighting that tinder bundle with a lighter and things like that because that's going to show you how those materials burn um how quickly it's going to burn and how thoroughly it's going to burn because those are the three big things that you're going to be looking for in making your tinder bundles when you start with an ember and to blow it into a fire but yeah 100 percent number one thing start on your tinder bundles make sure they're good and i mean you can use those even with your normal fires you can set up a good uh, fire lay you can light that tinder bundle with your lighter as i said and you can slide it under and a good tinder bundle is going to get that fire going so much more efficiently it's one of those things even when i'm not using some sort of primitive fire method uh, i'll still make my tinder bundles in the same way and I generally try not to use paper, you know, like newspaper and stuff like that. Always take some in an emergency. Like, don't get me wrong. Rather have it, not rely on it, but if it goes bad or it starts to rain or the materials just end up being too wet or whatever the case may be, then I know I have that as a backup. Uh, and in a pinch, toilet paper will work great or any of those little fire starting methods like um, uh, petroleum jelly and cotton balls and all that good stuff. So, yeah. But, yeah. Start working on your 
tinder bundles um and then work up from there so dave on the side here real big monkey one comment i like stuffing cattail fluff in the center of tinder bundle but it uh but only if it's dry uh, when moist it'll actually deter the flame and i can't agree with you enough there dave when you're making tinder bundles in general the drier you have your materials the better you're going to be i mean that should go without explanation but just in case there you go the drier things are the easier they're going to burn and like I said, I use uh, cattail fluff very readily in my tinder bundles as well. Uh, when I find a good batch of them, I'll quite often cut a bunch of the heads off, throw in my bag, and I will make my own tinder kits for when I'm traveling out into the woods and stuff like that. I mean, if you can find them, we're out there walking around, and I've done that too. It's great. But once you bring them home and you harvest it and you cure it, you know it's going to be dry. Uh, and I mean, preparation is not cheating in my mind. You already went out there, you got the materials, you're just using them next time, in all honesty. So don't think you're cheating. Uh, there is no cheating, it's only learning, is the way I like to look at things. So give yourself every advantage you can when you're starting off. And yeah, Tinder Bundle's a great place to start. Now once you get your Tinder Bundle figured out, the first method of fire starting that I usually recommend to people is going to be a ferro rod. And I hear you saying, well ferro rod's not primitive fire but it kind of is you're not using a lighter and it's a good place to start because it's going to show you how well that tinder bundle is going to take a spark and generally with a ferro rod you can set up some pretty hardy tinder with that generally you can get uh, birch bark strips going you can usually ignite paper uh, dry grasses and stuff will usually take a spark out of that because they burn really really hot so it's a good place to start because it gives yourself a little confidence because they are a little easier than some of the other methods to work with. Um, but it's also going to show you how that Tinder bundle from step one is going to work. And if you hear me saying that a lot, that's because it is literally your foundation, your Tinder bundles. Um, now, when it comes to ferro rods, first thing I'm going to say, and it's personal opinion, is the larger the rod, uh, it makes it a little easier to learn on it. So if you're not used to using a ferro rod, a lot of people get those ones from the, like the dollar store, and I have nothing against the dollar store, don't misunderstand, but the ones that come in bracelets... Uh, or the ones with the, actually the ones with the magnesium block aren't too bad, but the ones in the bracelets and the tiny little ones and short ones, a lot of people get those, try to use on those, and they just don't got the form that's needed to correctly throw a good spark with one of those, and generally those smaller ones aren't the highest quality rods to begin with, but um, not saying you can't use one once you get a little practice in, you know, what's pushing too hard and what's not, because if you push too hard on a ferro rod, you're going to dig into it hard, you're going to get some big hot sparks, but you run the risk of breaking that ferro rod if it's uh, one of the cheaper brands or a little smaller brand. Um, and yeah, so I recommend getting a good size one. I like like the uh, 3 8 half inch size. I still carry one of those. I have lots of little ones and stuff too. But I generally throw those in like my day packs and stuff like that where I'm not going to be relying on it as my primary source of ignition. Generally where I'm going to be using a lighter or something like that. And I keep the ferro rod as a backup because honestly ferro rod, even if you get it wet and muddy, you can wipe it off and it's going to work. Um, and it's going to work pretty faithfully once you get good with it. The other thing I'll say in a ferro rod, get yourself a decent scraper. I know everybody likes to use the back of their knife. That's all good and dandy. It just has to be a high carbon knife. Well, actually, if it's a high carbon knife, you'll get sparks off it too. But I prefer a high carbon knife. But it just has to have a 90 degree edge more than anything. So it'll shave off some of that stuff. Because the way it works is um, a lot like flint and steel. Which we'll talk about here in a minute. It's taking off very small shavings it oxidizes and it creates uh you know a flame or an ember or at least a spark in this case uh dave give a scout a lighter and they'll never learn about tinder give them a ferro rod and they will be forced to learn about tinder and that's exactly it dave that's why i recommend a ferro rod starting afterwards because then you have the base on or at least the knowledge or the attempt at making a decent tinder pile then you can see how it ignites because a lot of people tend to skip the tinder pile a little bit they'll just throw some stuff together and say oh there you go because they're used to using a lighter and it is kind of a different kettle of fish you got to slow it down you got to make sure it's dry and then you move forward and then the ferro rod comes in she'll like that fairly easily you probably won't have to cup it and make uh, any kind of like air into it to fan a flame usually with the ferro rod you'll get the flame and then you'll get to see how that tinder bundle burns i still suggest making it a little larger. Simply then it gives you the opportunity to move it. Um, me, myself, even when I'm using a ferro rod, I generally don't try and put my tinder directly 
under my kinglin and strike it from there. Uh, if it goes wrong and it's a bad strike or something like that, you're going to end up knocking off, knocking over all your kindling. And I mean, then you're back to square one. Maybe your tender bundle like knights and your kindling's not there. And it just creates confusion. So what I like to do, make a fire lay, white your tinder outside the fire lay. Once it's ignited, then you can just kind of push it under the, the, the fire lay. And that holds true with any of these things that we're going to move on to. Uh, so the next one that I like consider true primitive fire making is flint and steel. It's a great one that I like people to start on because it's still not overly difficult. Uh, it can be made with very common items, especially my neck of the woods. You can find quartz almost anywhere. Uh, it's very prominent on the beach. Anywhere really where there's running water, you're going to find some sort of quartz. In different locations, you may have access to flint or chert. Um, and they're really, really excellent. And if you want to learn a little bit more about those, I strongly suggest you just give it a little Google, um, and it'll give you a lot more information on how to identify it than I could simply because we don't have it in my neck of the woods. So, <laughs> I mean, I only know what I have learned by looking online as well. So I suggest you do a little research on that and go on about your merry way if you can find it. But yeah, when it comes to flint and steel, um, you can use an old file, and the best thing to, or the best way to find those is generally if you can find a flea market or a garage sale, something like that, and just go find an old power saw file or an axe file or something like that, and you can usually make two or three strikers out of a good size file. How do you make them, you ask? Well, the file's pretty much ready to go. The only thing I like to do is on the square edge, just take a, a grinder or something and give it a little brush over the... Um, the cuts in a file, or the, the lines, the serrations, whatever you want to call them, they tend to kind of stick out the sides. And when you're trying to strike it, sometimes they'll catch whatever you're striking against, and it might chip the stone and things like that. So I just like to smooth it off with a grinder, and you're good to go. Um, also, as you heard me mention before, if you have a high carbon steel knife, a lot of times they'll throw a spark too. And uh, you can use that. But, I mean, a file is the easiest way to go. You know it's going to be high carbon. It's, <laughs> and they're readily available. I mean, if you want to buy a new one, you can literally go to a place like Canadian Tire, Walmart, wherever. You're going to pick up a, a file. Just grab, like I said, an axe file is the, the preference that I go for. Um, now, making your char cloth, once again, that's pretty easy. You can do it right at home, especially if you've got a, a wood stove or an outside fire pit or something like that. And the idea behind char cloth or char material is you're basically burning it without oxygen. The easiest way to do it, and I won't get into it too, too specifically because videos to come, uh, you just get yourself a can or something like that. I might even have one here. Yeah, so this is just an old candy tin. All you do is put a couple holes in the side of it, just around the lip, basically so that the holes can stay out, and when you close the lid, the holes will be covered. You throw your material in there, you stick it on some coals, smoke will start coming out. Once the smoke dies out, close the lid. Takes uh, So basically you're burning that material, no oxygen, the smoke is pushing all the oxygen and stuff out, and just as the smoke stops puffing out you close it simply so it doesn't pull oxygen back in and cause all that stuff to burn because if it burns inside then it's no longer charred it's actually burnt so any case you'll come out with a black material and that's usually char cloth or char material now what makes good char cloth uh any organic material honestly 100 percent cotton shirt jeans a lot of people use those cut them in strips stuff them in the can make your char cloth uh any kind of punky wood same kind of deal. You can char that. That's easy enough. Uh, grasses and stuff. A lot of people make what's called a tinderbox. You may hear that um, going around as well. And basically that's just a whole bunch of charred material that sits in like an Altoids can or some sort of container. And you just throw sparks into the box. And basically whatever piece ignites, you take it out. And there are some advantages to that. Uh, it gives you a larger area to throw sparks on. Me personally, I just like the, the cloth. And there's kind of a way that you can hold it on the stone and hit it with a striker and it will guide the spark into that. And boom, now you have your ember or your spark. And the beauty of char cloth is you can make your ember as big or small as you really want. So I would start off bigger, give yourself almost like inch by inch, if not two, you know, like an inch by inch square. 
that's going to give you lots it only takes a tiny little spark and it'll start to ember you can blow on it just ever so gently and it'll spread that out and that's going to give you a nice large ember to start working with as you get better with it you learn how to strike the stone you get used to your spark uh your striker things like that you can take that char cloth and shrink it down till it's about quarter sized is usually what i like to go and even that's a little large but still I like having a little bit of an advantage. So a quarter size piece of char cloth is what you should try and get down to. Uh, and that'll, you know, that way you're just not wasting material. But you're still using enough that it's going to give you a decent ember. Now this is going to be the first time that you can put that ember into the bird's nest or the tindle bundle from step one. This is really going to give you your first experience of taking and blowing that ember into a flame. Uh, once again, the advantage of char cloth is it's a pretty hardy ember. It's hard to blow it out. Uh, it burns relatively hot. It's going to help you develop those skills on how to blow a flame into a tinder bundle because that's a skill in its own. And if anybody remembers, uh, Ben and I will talk a little bit about the bow drill competition that we had at one of the, uh, or the last Nova Scotia Bushcraft Gathering. Uh, we did get an ember on one, and then we could not get that ember into a flame. Um, or the contestant couldn't, probably there, there wasn't enough prep in the tinder bundle. And at that point, like they went for a long time, they were probably tired, breathing a little heavy put a little too much force into it and ended up burning their ember out. So it, it'll it give you some experience in nursing that into flame. Um, and there's different different ways of doing that, blowing an ember into a flame. You'll see lots of people, they'll wave the tinder bundle around. Works good because it's a gentle, constant breeze of air. Um, I use that sometimes, but generally I, I just blow into it. Uh, after some experience, you can get how softly, how hard. I Honestly, it's... A lot to do by ear I listen to how that is reacting inside the tinder bundle and that tells me how much I oxygen I need to put into it if that makes any kind of sense and if it doesn't right now once you start practicing with it a little bit hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense uh, a lot of other people will go by how much smoke is coming out uh, generally I guess you're gonna use a lot of your senses when you're kind of doing it but it's one of those things you just gotta practice practice and practice and then practice some more because everybody thinks it's the easy part it's definitely not the easy part getting the ember is generally the easier part if you have bad uh bad skill let's say at blowing that ember into a flame so we've talked about ferro rods we talked about flint steel char cloth tinder boxes um so then we're going to move on to what i have labeled as like assisted friction fires and what I mean by assisted friction fires, that's going to be, to me anyway, it's like your bow drill. So your two-person bow drill, single bow drill. I strongly recommend uh, looking at how to do the two-person bow drill. Bow drill is one of those things, it takes a lot more effort, especially the first couple times you're out when you're still developing those skills um, and getting the rhythm of things. It, it takes a lot more effort and a lot more stamina than you'll actually think it does um and honestly that comes a little bit from watching it on youtube and things like that because some people can make it look absolutely effortless and i can tell you from experience that comes with experience once you learn the proper method of walking your arm in around your leg so your spindle's not moving you figure out how to make a good socket so it's not taking a lot of friction from your spindle. You get the right materials. You know the pressure you got to push down, how long your stroke is with your bow. Like It all starts working into making it look a lot more easy than it is. But the first time out, I can almost guarantee you, you're going to be tired. You're going to work muscles that you didn't think you were going to work while you were doing it. And you're probably going to have to adjust your spindle two or three times. Those are the big things most people stumble on. Uh, and the biggest being spindle. It's, you got to get your arm in close. You got to walk it against your leg and try and take as much movement out of that as possible. Because every time, as it's wiggling, it's changing the position in the socket. It's changing the position in the hearth board. Uh, you may let a little air in there that shouldn't be in there, cooling stuff down. Honestly, it, it's a skill in its own and it's well worth practicing. And I tell people when they start, with assisted friction fires first couple times don't even try to get an ember you're just setting yourself up for defeat unfortunately and it, it's just the truth of the matter focus on 
getting that spindle locked in and making sure it doesn't move. That's what I like to tell people. That's what I like to see people doing when they're first starting. That way they can get principle down before, or sorry, they can get method down um, before action, if that makes any kind of sense. You have to have a good form in all of this or it, it's just not going to work out. And that's with a lot of primitive fire. It all comes down to form. It comes into practice. Uh, and you should practice it as much as you possibly can simply because it, takes the practice and honestly practice it at home before you go into the woods or if you're going to practice it in the woods which is fine too bring a reliable backup even when i go in even when ben goes in any of the guys we go out with you always get a bick doesn't matter what you bring to intend to start the fire with you want a reliable backup i'll still carry a bick i'll still carry paper like i said i'll still carry a fail safe way of getting fire going be it uh cotton swabs with wax on them uh, dryer went all of that stuff works great but it's a solid way to get a fire going just in case you try for that primitive fire and you just wear yourself out um, the second trip that ben and i did on the side of the lake we tried to do bow drill fires we got a few embers going but uh it was a little damp a little high in humidity we we're having a difficult time and after two or three embers we were pooped we we just literally couldn't uh put enough more effort out to continue bow drilling and we resorted to using a ferro rod i think in this instance but we still had our lighters and stuff like that but i mean it, it just wore us out we did it after gathering our firewood and setting up our shelters and our hammocks and tarps and i think even after we set up the deep fryer and stuff like that so all of this works into it it was getting a little later in the evening we were already starting to get a little tired and it it just wore us out flat which uh it, it's gonna do like i said it takes a lot of stamina and a lot of patience to to make it happen and once again don't try and go for an ember right out of the gate uh there's so many little minute things that you need to look for like i said your spindle the bow stroke even the notch in the hearth board you can almost have an entire talk just on the notch because different people believe different things and different materials i agree different ways work and speaking of materials um here in Nova Scotia, what I like to use is either usually a fur spindle with a popple or popular or I think they're trembling aspen elsewhere, a uh, hearthboard or fireboard, whatever you want to call it. That's what I like to use. Uh, popple on popple works too. Fur on fur I've had uh, some success with. The, the problem with your softwoods is they produce resin. And the resin's going to act almost like a lubricant and it's going to rob some of your heat so you have to work a little harder with them that's the only downside to them so a good starting place uh that i'm taking from another feller that used to do a great example of this sam he used popple and popple and then you don't have those uh resins and stuff acting like a lubricant and stealing your heat and sometimes they can even bind up your your powder or your uh, what's the word I'm looking here for? Mel? Oh, she's got her headphones on. Uh, your powder or what? the fine material. I, I think the word's powder. Is that the word I'm looking for? Powder? Yeah, for when you're doing a bow drill. Sure. Sure. Anyway, the powder that goes into your notch, sometimes it'll bind that together and it'll stick. Um, so once you do get into the bowing and you start producing powder, start producing smoke, Smoke does not mean the ember is going. Not initially anyway. That just means you're getting warm enough for it to ignite that ember. So generally once you see smoke, I like to do another 30 strokes. If that makes any kind of sense. As soon as I see good thick smoke, I try to go 30 more full lengths uh, before I even check for an ember. And a lot of times once you stop to check for the ember, I like to just stop, hold the spindle in. Don't pull it away right away. Because your arms might be a little jelloey and stuff like that. It might spring out because it's wrapped around the rope. It'll kick your hearth board over. All that powder is going to fall out. Uh, Dave, Willow on Willow works great down south, followed by basswood, cottonwood, and box elder. Um, I know those are trees you have down below. I'm wondering if Willow... Uh, we have weeping willows around here. They're usually not indigenous. They uh, People bring them in as ornamental trees. I think I know where there's one. I may try nabbing a piece off it. I know the people that own it, and it's a rather big tree now, so they'll probably be okay with me stealing a limb on it when they prune it. And I'd like to give that a go. Um, but yeah, any kind of softer material is going to work good 
for uh, a bow drill. So generally the way you check it, take your thumbnail, jab it into the woody part, not the bark part. See if you can, you know, leave an imprint. If you can leave an imprint, you can at least attempt using it. Uh, and I'm not going to profess that I know all the different combinations out there or that I even know the best ones. I just mentioned what I happen to use. And uh, like I said, fur spindle, popple board, uh, the socket generally doesn't matter, but uh, I use hardwood just so it doesn't burn in as much and the bow really doesn't matter either. I also know a lot of people that swear by one piece of wood makes everything. Same spit, like you take a good piece of wood, you split it down to make your hearth board, then you carve it down to make your spindle, you knock a block off it for your socket, like they are all about the one piece makes everything and that's perfectly acceptable too. Once again, not saying I know the best method. I just know what works for me. Um, and the good thing about bow drills, you can jump on Amazon and literally type in bow drill. And they will show you kits that are pre-made. They've already matched up. They're super easy woods. Generally, they're cotton woods and stuff like that, like Dave said. Um, that match together really well. And they'll come with sockets. And there's some really neat ones there. And you can just practice holding the spindle still and uh, proper bowing stroke technique and know that the materials you are using are going to cause an ember. Um, and then it's not a, a matter of question, if that makes any sense. Because even if you're doing everything right and it's bad materials, like if you use a white maple, you're going to get tons of smoke, but <laughs> unless you really got some pressure and a whole lot of speed, it's probably not going to ignite into an ember. So that will get people discouraged. They'll just unfortunately pick the wrong materials and uh, then it won't work, and of course, then you kind of get self-defeated and things like that. So, definitely the right materials, and I suggest if you want to try it, buy one of those kits. They're not that expensive. I think 20 bucks will land you one. And then you don't have to worry about that. You can practice the form. Once the form's good and you get that ember, then you get to put that into your tinder bundle. Hopefully you've already practiced with the char cloth and stuff, so you have an idea of how to blow that ember into a flame. Now, when you start using these assisted friction fires, the ember is going to be even more delicate than it was with the char cloth. Meaning, if you put too much pressure uh, from the air coming out of your mouth, you can blow it apart or you can blow it straight down through your tinder bundle. So, just keep that in mind. Start really gentle, and this is generally where you see that wavy method come in really strong. Um, and then progress up as the flame or the ember gets bigger inside. Or another way is you can use what I've coined as an ender, uh, ember extender, uh, really dry chaga, get a little bit of that powdered down. It's generally going to stay a little longer than these uh, powdered materials that you just got from the bow drill. Um, and yeah, I, I won't go too much into that because I'll cover it in a video. Uh, now lastly, what I want to talk about is what I consider manual friction fires or Basically, we're to the rub two sticks together, you get fire kind of deal. Um, and examples of that, you're going to get your hand drill, uh, fire plow. Mm, those are the two big ones that come to mind. I'm sure I'm missing a few. But these ones take a lot of practice. And I mean a lot of practice. When I first learned to do a hand drill, I practiced for months literally months just sitting outside in under my pergola uh so dave i stopped blowing on mine and just started waving it around and and i like i said that's 100 percent legit dave a lot of people use that method they really like that method i myself have just had better luck blowing on it for whatever reason i i got something that works for me i can generally caress it to life a little easier than waving it around however if i'm out of breath I 100% go to the waving method because then you don't have that potential to, you know, you're trying to get a breath in, so you're trying to breathe out really fast and you end up blowing that ember through. Uh, so yeah, hand drills. I practiced for months. My hands were full of blisters because of incorrect form, uh, pushing too hard and a lot of other things. So definitely practice at home. Expect you're going to get a couple blisters. Hopefully you don't. You stop before then. I was stubborn. I had really bad ones right in the palms of my hands. And I mean, if you start doing that out in the woods and you're going to be gone for a little while, uh, you run some real risk of infection. 
uh, and just your hands are all beaten to heck, honestly. So, and then it's hard to maneuver around your campsite and other things like that. So I definitely suggest practicing at home. Uh, same kind of deal. Don't try and get an ember right away. Um, materials, especially my neck of the woods, they're pretty rare for making hand drill sets. Uh, what I have had walk on is bulrush or cattail um, stem and popple. The only problem is I don't think maybe once in the fall, but generally it is really hard to find a cattail that's dry enough to use as a spindle right out of the gate. Um, how I do it for when I'm doing uh, like showing people or uh, doing demonstrations, I'll cut my cattails and bulrushes maybe the previous year and I'll dry them all out of the winter or all over the winter. I'll take them inside and literally just put them behind the fireplace and just let them slowly dry. And that way I know they're bone dry and I can actually do a demonstration with them because it's just that tricky to find something in my neck of the woods. Now, I know in other places, it's really not that bad. Um, I'm trying to think. I can't think of the name of it now. Um, but anyway, any kind of dry plant with a pithy center, I think is the name for it, like a softer center, is going to be able to be used as a hand drill. I'll save that more to... Uh, the video mullen i think is the, the word i was trying to think that sometimes you can find in nova scotia but it's incredibly rare but i know it's more common in some of the upper states so definitely check around this is one of those ones you're gonna have to do a little research for your area uh when i started out i literally googled uh hand drill materials nova scotia and just looked and looked and looked and looked and narrowed it down and figured it out and yeah what worked for me like i said cattail spindle um and a popple board i tried it with fur i can't remember if i got an ember going or not um but i do know i got it with the popple popple had to be bone dry and that's the thing with these hand drills everything has to be so dry and everything is so delicate when you're working with it if you put too much down pressure you're going to break your spindle end up throwing splinters in your hand it's just not a good deal uh there is kind of a technique with your hands where you push one down and then you angle and you turn again and that way and it, it keeps your hands at the same level on your spindle otherwise the common one you'll see is people just rub it back and forth and push their hand down and then you have to stop every single time reposition your hands up and work it back down uh and every time you stop you're losing heat out of that and it's really important with hands uh hand drills to try and keep as much heat in so what i like to do is use that floating method uh, and if you do google it i believe that's what it's called it's the floating hand method hand drill and i'll warm everything up until i get a little smoke unfortunately i'm not good enough with that method to continue to put the downward pressure and actually get the ember that way once i get smoke and i know the heat's in there then i'll move to the pressure down and really fast uh spinning in that way and that that's just what works with me uh, I do have a video on the channel if you guys want to check it out. I think it's just, you know, uh, I think the name of it is Hand Drill Using Local Materials. And if you search on our page, you'll get that up. And literally, I did it at my office. I'm not condoning or recommending starting embers in your house. Uh, my setup here, I, I have a, it's like a slab kind of floor. It's really hard to burn through. Still shouldn't have done it. It was stupid. But anyway, uh, you can see how I did it there. Now, something else you can try is a fire plow, and I'm going to openly admit I have tried numerous materials, numerous times, different methods, trying to make a fire plow here in Nova Scotia, and I have yet to get an ember from it. And I'm sure it's some of my skill in it, not knowing. I've never had anyone show me with any of these methods. If you can get somebody to show you and watch you do it, they're going to fix a lot of the little nuance mistakes that you might make but anyway yeah i haven't actually got a successful fire plow using native materials here uh, i've done a like a fire saw using bamboo but the bamboo was imported <laughs> i didn't find it in nova scotia i can guarantee you that but it works really well bamboo if you can get that stuff makes it real easy to make a fire with a fire saw um but yeah i i haven't had much luck here uh, Dave, down south, we like mowing. Horseweed, sow thistle, bull thistle, daisy, fleabane, and cattail. So those are all great spindle ideas for the, <laughs> if you have those in your areas. 
Like I said, here in Nova Scotia, we have Moen. I think I've seen it three places that I can remember. Uh, and Cattail. What do you guys use for your hearth boards down there, Dave? Like, uh, are you back to your uh, cottonwoods, basswoods, and stuff like that? Or is there anything else you would use with a hand drill there? Um, sorry, getting back on topic. If you're going to start with a hand drill, I recommend using an assisted hand drill. And we'll talk about that a little bit in the video I make, but generally it's just taking a piece of string, you tie it around the top of your spindle, and you hook it on your thumbs, and that way you can keep the downward pressure with your thumbs while you work on your spinning technique. Uh, it's the way I would recommend learning to do a hand drill unless you're willing to jump in with a whole bunch of variables. Uh, it's going to teach you how much pressure to put down, how fast to spin, focus on getting the full length of your hand into the spin and not short spinning it because a lot of people have a tendency to short spin uh, and it just takes so much effort to try and short spin something into an ember. Uh, Darren Red Cedar. Okay. Uh, once again, cedar is not a popular tree in Nova Scotia. I had the, Sometimes you'll get them ornamentally. Cedar bushes, a couple cedar trees. I got a weeping cedar in the backyard, but just out in the wild, once again, I might know of one. Eastern Red Cedar. Okay. Uh, now, New Brunswick, I know you start getting into cedars and stuff like that, so maybe for you folks out there, that is going to be a viable option. I on Fortunately, just don't have a lot of cedar here. Once again, popple's kind of our go-to tree. Um, and willow, again, as Dave said, not super native to Nova Scotia. Not that I'm common with, once again, ornamental trees and stuff. Uh, and I may try some of that if I can get a piece of it. Uh, I'll, have to, I'll have to go down there and check that out and talk to those folks. Uh, but yeah, the big thing with hand drills, fire plows, stuff like that, it takes an amazing amount of strength and... Um, not so much strength, sorry, stamina. Uh, you are creating that simply on the power of your own body. Now, when you're spinning a spindle, your arms are going to get tired, your chest is going to get tired, your back's going to get tired just from the way you're sitting. When you're trying to do a fire plow, uh, your arms and chest, once again, are going to kill you. Um, they're just going to ache and ache and ache. Uh, there's another form of a fire plow that I have seen used in Nova Scotia. I have not had a chance to try it on my own they used a piece of dry chaga and cut a v into a dry piece of hardwood and took the chaga and rubbed the friction on the the v to hardwood and apparently that is supposed to work and it's one of the viable ways to get a fire plow to work in nova scotia but i have yet to try it and i think that person might actually have been in new brunswick i'm not sure but uh it it, it, will, it looks like an interesting way and i plan to try it sometime this year to see if I can actually get a fire plow to ignite at this point. Dave, if you find a large enough honeysuckle vine, it's the ultimate hearthboard material. Honeysuckle. Um, yeah, I could see that. Once again, you're into that kind of dry outer casing, kind of pithy inside. And I think that's the word I'm looking for, is pith. Uh, and I could be wrong, and I'm sure somebody will correct me, but it basically means the inner core of the plant is a little softer or trumpet vine. I'm pretty sure we don't have those here in Nova Scotia, but I would love to get down south and see some of these other materials, uh, especially yucca. Yucca is a really fibrous plant, really easy to make rope out of. You can make super fine rope, comes with a needle. It's great for making the cordage to make fire bows uh, for my research and things like that. I think it'd be a lot of fun to go elsewhere and try different types of materials to make fire. Um, yeah. So there are a couple other primitive methods, but the, I find that they're back to basically the concept of these ones. And then you're into like the fire drill, which is not a bow drill, but it's like a, a rope assisted pump drill. Uh, but it's just a different way of doing the fire bow or bow drill in my idea or in my mind, I should say. So you can research that. Um, there's, like I said, the fire saw which is you make a notch and then you rub another piece of material in it. It's just a different variation of the fire plow. The only one we never really mentioned is Rudiger rolls. Uh, and I do suggest you give that a check because all you need is like a little piece of cotton and either some... Uh, they uh, Most people that I know that use it use the insides out of those heater packs, like the hand warmer packs. Uh, it's just iron oxide and they use that. I, once again, don't have the best luck with Rudica rolls, even though I'm told they're supposed to be one of the easier ways to learn how to 
make a fire without flame, but uh, I, I strongly recommend people try that, and I'm definitely going to try to improve my skills on that as well, and hopefully I'll include it in the uh, Basics of Fire videos that are to follow. Um, so that's all I really want to talk about tonight. I want to try and keep it short. I was hoping it would only be around 30 minutes. I'm running into 40 now. Uh, but just to touch a little bit, everything we talked about here tonight, I do plan on making a video series. I'm hoping the first one is going to come out on the 23rd. Uh, that's the tent of date, and then I'll just be releasing them over time, and we'll just be covering one topic each time, and hopefully it'll be an introduction for people that want to learn to make primitive fire, and give you guys an idea of where to start, and how to work into some of these things. Once again, not going to say that I'm the best at this or a master at it. I think if you think you're a master and you're not learning, then you probably don't understand the project, if that makes, uh, you know, not to be cliche. But yeah, uh, this is the way I'm going to set these videos up is what works for me in my local area. So hopefully everybody will be able to take something out of those. You'll find those on the Atlantic Bushcraft YouTube page. Uh, which you can find listed down below here, I believe. Uh, actually, it's not, but just go to YouTube, search Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures, you'll find us. Uh, I think it might be youtube.com forward slash C forward slash Atlantic Bushcraft, and that'll bring you there too. But in either case, you can look on our YouTube, see the video of the hand drill, uh, and you can look at some of the upcoming videos that are hopefully going to start rolling out on this Primitive Fire thing. Uh, I'm really excited about it. Primitive Fire has always been a, a passion of mine when it came to bushcrafting. It's something I practice a lot. I love trying different methods. I try goofy things that other people may not think about simply because I want to know what works and what doesn't work. And honestly, finding out something really doesn't work is great information to have too that way you're not questioning it while you're out in the woods so at any of these steps if you just find something that's like oh my gosh that totally doesn't work i can't believe i've done it that way don't look at it as a defeat that's still completely a win simply because you learned what not to do and that's good too but anyway like i said i ran my time up uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to shoot us a message on Facebook. You can leave comments on the YouTube video. If you folks are out there listening, definitely uh, check out either of those mediums, either Facebook, YouTube. Go to our website, atlanticbushcraft.ca, and there's a contact us link. Whatever you need to do, shoot your questions forward. I'll try and answer them as best I can. Ben will add his two cents when he's uh, back and able to get on. And, yeah, we love hearing from you folks. Hopefully we get a lot of good feedback. Okay, everybody, have yourselves a good night, and we'll talk to you next week.